Hi everyone, I'm Jamie. I'm Amy, and this is Clever. And in this special Clever Extra, brought to you by Formica Group, we're going to share a rebroadcast of another podcast that Jamie and I produce called Neo Conversations. Neo Conversations is Neocon's official podcast about the exciting changes and issues impacting the commercial design industry, hosted by me, Amy Devers. We especially loved the topic of Episode 7 about designing branded spaces, a conversation that digs into how to translate a brand into a physical experience, and we thought you would love it too. In this episode, Amy explores the fascinating topic with Renee Hightree Darrington, International Design Lead for Formica Group, and Abbott Miller, a partner at world-renowned design studio Pentagram. So, without further ado, here's Episode 7 of Neo Conversations, Designing Branded Spaces. Support for Neo Conversations comes from Formica Group, the provider of durable surfaces that fuse great design with purposeful functionality. Formica Coordinated Solutions offer the full spectrum of Formica brand colors and patterns in four distinct products, high-pressure laminate, hard-stop decorative protection panels, compact, and Formica Infinity. All Formica products are designed to enhance a space as a singular surface or as several different products specified together. From beauty to durability, textural to function, there's a solution for everything with Formica Group. Visit Formica.com to order free samples for your next project. As brands evolve, as society evolves, we got to figure out what kind of palette or what kind of material is inspiring interior designers. It's a space, it's a room. Let it be a room first. The interventions that you make, you can do this work and stay in the realm of material and color. Ideally, there's one logo in the room. Hi, everyone. I'm Amy Devers, and this is Neo Conversations, Neocon's official podcast about the exciting changes and issues impacting the commercial design industry. This season, we're doing a deep dive into innovations in materials, sustainability, and flexible space design. In this episode, we are asking, how can the character and history of a brand be effectively designed into physical space? How can the essence of a brand's purpose and values be translated into an experience? What does it mean to shape the materiality of a brand, in addition to the visual language? And how can designers create toolkits that can help implement the brand experience company-wide across varying international venues and locales, while still allowing for local interpretation and specificity? It's a fascinating and worthy endeavor, so I brought in two leading designers who have spent a lot of time thinking about these very questions and solving these problems to great effect. I'm Renee Hytree Darrington, and what I do for the Formica brand is I lead a team of designers that we forecast what's happening in interiors about one to two years out. We work with a great supply base to create all the raw materials that then go through all of our plants around the world. So we end up creating the toolbox that interior designers will use to create beautiful spaces. And I love to do this because for me, it's tying in industrial design and interior design and architecture all together based around a wonderful historic but yet modern looking material. My name is Abbott Miller and I've been a partner in the New York office of Pentagram for about 20 years and prior to that ran my own studio. I run a team of about six people, pretty small, within an organization that probably has about 200 people. And I focus on the intersection of graphic design, brand design, and three-dimensional interiors and exhibitions. And I really enjoy that kind of work because staying solely in the graphic construct, it can be frustrating. It's much more interesting when you kind of move beyond it and start to surround people with information and materials and colors that kind of start to inform how they interpret the world. Yes, that is the power that designers have, is informing how people interpret the world and also translating how the world has been interpreted into these spaces, which is something that, Abbott, you've done in your work. Since this episode is all about translating a brand into a physical experience, whether that's workplace, hospitality, or in your case, you've done a lot of museums and pop-up exhibitions and books even, you've translated the contextual history of a brand into a physical experience through a book. 
I want to start off by understanding the relationship between the two of you. You two have worked together and you both have experience shaping the materiality and the physical experience of a brand. So Abbott, let's start with you because I know you worked with Renee on a couple of projects, but at its essence, how would you describe the nature of your work and your approach? When I worked with Renee on the Formica project, it was a really natural fit because there was, on the one hand, this sort of incredible history that we were trying to tell in the form of a book. And I think even when we started it, we weren't quite sure what kind of book that would be. But then beyond that, it was sort of a bigger remit to kind of frame Formica in the 20th century and to think about, reflect on its status culturally, materially, aesthetically, and then also to just kind of uh, sit back and say, this is Formica now. And I had an incredibly fun time on this project because it had this element that I always love, which is a kind of archival depth of material. I remember when we went back into the storage rooms looking for material, it was really interesting how little of it had been formally organized. There was a book that came out, I think, 20 years ago, Renee, is that right? Yes, for our 75th anniversary. There was some work that was done on the history, but there was still a lot of raw material that formed the kind of knowledge base of how Formica was represented, um, how it was advertised globally. And I think what we realized was that this global story had not really been told as fully in the previous book. And so this was an opportunity to really dig in and kind of look at just what a big impact this material has had. And we kind of investigated both the visual history, but also just finding traces of Formica in literature, classic novels. We sort of excerpted all of these things and did a big remix in the form of the book. And that was um, a really satisfying project because I felt like we had pinpointed a status for Formica in the world that it's kind of been a part of. It's a zealig kind of material. It's been there. People sometimes embrace it. You know, when it first came out, it was very exotic, um, promoted as this kind of wonder material. Those dynamics of how people perceive a material and what it means to them was really the topic of the book. Well, and I think that's fascinating, too, from a brand perspective, because creating a book like that is an expression of self-awareness to the general public as well. Like, we understand how our brand has made an impact socially and culturally and on the built world. Our awareness of that is interaction with our customer. Yes, absolutely. And for me, as as the client with Abbott's work, mm-hmm. for me it was really cool how, by understanding the brand history, he then worked with me on an actual material or a collection. And that was a pure joy because it started with graphics, it started with concepts, it started with color palettes. And then Abbott actually came in to the printer's lab where we actually worked with inks and rotogravure cylinders and we played around and tried new things. And we, we really did some things that the printer didn't think we could do, like getting these incredibly small dots on some of the designs that just led such an elegance to a printed material. Um, so for me, the experience by having Abbott first do the exploration of the brand and the brand history really worked well to get to the actual material that we were then turned around and sold out into the marketplace. And that was even interesting because we had such excitement. It was rolled out globally Mm -hmm. and was almost like putting a party dress on. We could explore and we could be bold with color. And, you know, the Formica girl who was 100 years old, she could now celebrate that. And with that, our interior design and architectural customers actually loved playing with it. We had a lot of placement into, I would say, little branded interiors, meaning like the education market. They loved working with bright colors. So the bright colors and the playful graphics were ideal for them. Even some of our long-term customers like Herman Miller allowed us to put these beautiful materials onto their Eames tea tables, which was wonderful just to be part of that brand. So So we really crossed over a bunch of brands that historically have all grown up together, and then we got to celebrate, you know, at the 100th anniversary. That sounds like an amazing collaboration. 
I do want to bring it back down to the essence of the artistry of translating a brand into a physical experience. So both of you have logged years and years of work experience thinking about how to translate something intangible into something tangible. So I'd really like to talk about what you think is important when it comes to distilling down the essence of a brand and then trying to translate it into a physical experience. Are there examples of your creative process or of certain projects that you can talk about that would help us understand what your your thinking is there behind that? Well, I could use the example of having worked with Harley Davidson for a, a few different projects. One was a 100th anniversary sort of celebration, exhibition, a kind of traveling show that went to 10 different cities across the globe. And I remember thinking that this is such an iconic brand that has such a clear sort of design vocabulary and history in the form of the motorcycle itself. Um, It's not just a sort of graphic identity, it's sort of a whole world. And because the show was traveling all over the world, there was a kind of obligation to make it efficient and make it as transportable as possible. Mm -hmm. And I remembered promoting this idea that we should really be working primarily with fabric in this particular um, context because we really needed that agility. And then finding that every time we turned to fabric, it felt like just completely wrong as a material choice because this is a pretty heavy industrial object with this design legacy that probably the last thing you associate with Harley Davidson is fabric. And I remember it's thinking Kevlar. that, <laughs> right? And I remember thinking, well, as long as it sort of stays w- in that territory with the color, you could get away with it. But you know, attempt after attempt to really embrace using fabric in this kind of big context, uh, it just felt like no, this is this is not going to work. It meant working with a materiality and a construction language that was much more related to the spirit of industrial manufacturing and the product design itself. That's like my big takeaway is if a brand has a physical language and a material language, you really most often need to respond very closely to it. I mean, I think you can play juxtaposition sometimes in some certain brand areas, but I think if the language is already very articulated and deeply embedded, you need to stay in that world. But right now, I've been doing a lot of work with American Express, which is a very intangible services-based company that has a very strong graphic heritage, Mm -hmm. but the materiality is not nearly as rooted or specific. And in that case, what we've done is we've tied everything on the heritage of these graphic elements, which, you know, if you look at any American Express credit card, you see that there's actually a whole lot of sort of graphic signifiers going on. There's the texture of the credit card, uh, which they call the world service pattern. There's the little gingerbread border. There's the centurion himself. There's the logo itself. Um, There's all of these great little sort of vocabulary elements that formed kind of the focus for us of the graphic language. But when we brought that to an environmental scale, Mm -hmm. we felt like it was sort of important to actually go into real materials and to allow real materials to actually change the nature of those graphic elements. So translating a classic pattern into a standard kind of ceramic tile grid made those elements more interesting because they weren't just blown up and applied, but they actually had gone through some kind of transformation. And I I think of a lot of the graphic development that we do as starting from the very abstract world of pure graphics and then moving into something physical and wanting that transformation to happen. So either the medium or the sort of grain of the information changes, even choices like what material do you print on? Mm -hmm. Is it reflective? Is it flat? Those really simple moves start to really lend materiality in a way that 
avoids what can be sort of just the sense of graphics just applied everywhere, which have no sense of scale or touch. That's what my fear is. When I hear terms like branded interiors, I really don't want to just see somebody's logo, you know, in a silkscreen or a vinyl graphic or not that there's anything wrong with signage, but unthought through signage. It feels it, so surface level and yeah, almost as and assaults your senses as opposed to invites them. Right. I think that sort of first do no harm yes. <laughs> principle is really an important one for interior design and for branding and graphics. It's a space. It's a room. Let it be a room first. The interventions that you make, you know, you can do this work and stay in the realm of material and color. And ideally, there's one logo in the room. And I, I think that's kind of interesting where if you don't have a stronger material language or if you don't have other things that are happening with the way you're translating the brand – you just keep repeating yourself. You say, like, well, over there's the, you know, we'll have a little bit of that part of the logo or a little bit of that part of the pattern. And it's really, uh, you start to feel kind of like, well, gee, I guess we're just smearing the brand everywhere. <laughs> yeah. um, it's a really bad feeling. Like, yeah. that's when you know that you need more ideas. <laughs> it's like the most simple solution. And that's why it's key to have interior designers really understand their client mm -hmm. so that they can go beyond the simple solution. You know, that's where we we get involved in becoming a toolbox. And we, we do have to offer brights because there's always that client that wants to do their logo color. Though the funny thing about that, doing your logo color and laminate, there are, you know, 10,000 Pantone tones that are used in all of the brands and logos around the world, right? So how can you be that to everybody? It's more of a difficult solution. But we do have, you know, your basic brights. Mm -hmm. But what we found with designers, there's like the big brand way of designing, interior designing. Or then there's the the smaller brand, the the small B brand, which means it's a it's a type of function, right? Say hospitality has kind of its own design language, and they don't have to be as in your face. Like Abbott said, they create their environment with various materials and services and spaces and and light and shadow, and that becomes the brand identity versus the big logo with spectrum yellow. For us, we had we have to offer it all, whether it's the simple solution or it's the more complex solution. And that's always the challenges because you have to pick up on as brands evolve, as society evolves, we got to figure out what kind of palette or what kind of texture, or what kind of visual or what kind of material is inspiring interior designers that then they feel comfortable trying to take their clients out of the normal comfort zone of just the basic branded logo space into something new. Yes. And it involves, I'm sure it involves a a subtlety, a, a richness of textural options. Formica is ubiquitous in, in culture, but it's also known for color and graphic patterns that are associated with certain time periods. There are also some textures that are associated with certain time periods. And now that it's been around for over 100 years, we can actually pull from those associations and work with them as part of a design palette. Sometimes we want something sort of nostalgic. Sometimes mm -hmm. we want something that evokes a, a nebulous period of time or a very neutral period of time. Other times, like Home Depot, you want your orange everywhere. And because it's such an industrial space, like the utilitarian materiality of Formica is the perfect choice all of the the grease and dings of construction work wipe off so easily. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and that's that's something that we've had a lot of fun with working with working with designers that actually do spaces like that which, which fit kind of into our sweet spot of remodeling, you know, for the residential segment. Okay, so this might seem obvious today, but I think it still merits discussion. What would both of you say are like the business case basics in favor of spending the time, effort, and money to build brand DNA into interiors and or physical experiences, including books, pop-ups, and other sort of exhibitions or extensions of the brand? I I'm interested in what you think not only helps drive the bottom line, but helps create the narrative of the brand and influence culture. Like, why is it culturally worthwhile? 
I just finished a round of focus groups with interior designers throughout the U.S., so mm-hmm. it's kind of top of mind. And as you talk with designers, they have kind of they have several buckets of work that they need to do. There are the, their traditional clients that might be doing some remodeling. So they, when they when they look at their business case about what kind of materials they're going to use, they need to kind of blend into what was already in place mm-hmm. as they kind of try to extend the the branded interior into this year, right? And and so therefore, you might say that they're making decisions based on longevity because that type of client, that type of space has more longevity built into it, like the, the healthcare market, for instance, that, you know, or the education market, higher ed, you know, some of these spaces need to think about longevity. So their business case sometimes might be, I would say, more safe, and they work more into the neutrals palette, or they need to look back a little bit and bring it forward with something else. So there is that bucket. Now, some of the interior designers that get to create the new sort of branded space and, you know, they have clients that need to be on the forefront, their mm-hmm. business case allows them to take more chances and to work with different colors that are atypical or different finishes and materials that are atypical. But what they have is they have the ability to extend forward, which is really cool. So the interior design world, they have they have a very tricky job of working with all the different clients, with all the different needs, you know, thinking about durability, longevity, you know, what the visual looks like. You know, they have a big job to do. Yeah, and it influences culture. I mean, if it's a workplace or a hospitality environment, it's going to influence the way people react to the space, the way people also translate that space out into the world through their own retelling of that space, either in social media or word of mouth or however that brand sort of works its way into our cultural psyche. One of the things that I think is really almost like the most pervasive, consistent issue is distinction. Making this brand, this particular space look unique and kind of stake out its own territory, which is a kind of a goal of differentiation that I think every brand aspires to. You know, that's kind of the sort of the core value. The other one is consistency. So with American Express, with Formica, with really most global brands, uh, the other sort of factor that you're trying to hold on to is how can we be everywhere and have some degree of consistency when you know that hundreds of designers, interior designers, graphic designers, architects, when you know that all of these activities are only linked by the sort of tenants of the brand, And you need to kind of say what is and isn't part of the brand language. So that idea of control and consistency is sort of the highest sort of virtue of brand design. But at the same time, it has to be agile enough to understand and to allow for different interpretations that are going to happen locally. Sometimes I did a big project with Ritz-Carlton Sometimes that local expression starts to really dismantle the brand. And the project for Ritz-Carlton was a kind of about pulling, pulling it all back together. And I think that that's an example where you have hotels that are based in cities and hotels on beaches. They're all wanting to kind of do their version of the Ritz-Carlton brand. At the same time, from a global perspective, that brand is kind of getting sort of diluted by all of these localized expressions. So a lot of our work involves saying, what are the true core components of the brand that you really should not be kind of manipulating, filtering, reinterpreting? And then what are the territories that are free to interpret? And that has to do in our industry, in, in sort of brand identity world, that's much more focused on core brand graphics, but it also can extend into sort of the environmental and spatial and even the world of signage. What Abbott's talking about is in our DNA today because we have manufacturing sites all over the world. We have specific sales teams that work with these big brands. So as somebody like Pentagram and Abbott's team creates the identity and they want to work with one of our materials, we're able to replicate the materials around the world so that at least some of that DNA of that space can be 
specific and hold the brand identity together. So if I'm walking around, oh goodness, I was in Spain a couple weeks ago and I'm walking down and there's Burger King, you know, right right along the beach, there's a big Burger King. And it has the same brand identity in Spain that it does in Green Bay, Wisconsin. It's really interesting how the challenge that somebody designing for that brand and then we're working with the local execution, you know, how do you keep it together? And that's something that we love doing is we love supporting that in general, to keep that that vision vision going forward with our salespeople kind of looping in and bring, bringing the materials to the right spot at the right time. As you were telling that story, I was thinking about, yeah, you can, you can spot a knockoff brand by just how it tries and fails to replicate the brand language of an existing brand. And so if you, mm-hmm. if you don't adhere to it, or to the the certain things that you've identified as needing to be super consistent, then you do run the risk of just really confusing the customer all over the world. And it's funny because international travel has been so available now for the masses. And when they fly into different areas, they like to experience the local culture, but then they also want some familiarity. Mm-hmm. And therefore, some of the brands that have been successful at extending beyond their hometown – they offer that value to that customer that that wants a little bit of both, a little bit of a home or familiarity, as well as experiencing something new. So it's really delightful when you travel just to see that mishmash of big brands, local brands, promises of service from all different levels, and all that has to be supported by the interior space as you walk into it. And again, that's the, I kudos to the interior design world for trying to pull that all together. I want to get real practical for a second because you have both developed toolkits for brands and clients for them to then take out and use in order to create this consistency as they're interpreting it in all different parts of the world. What goes into the toolkit and how do you decide what is up for interpretation and what is not? There's a unique story for every brand. Mm -hmm. Um, Our experience is both... Corporate organizations like American Express, even Harley-Davidson, have already such a clear history and kind of codified brand story to tell that the things that are up for grabs are are really quite narrow, to be honest. I think that what we always try to do is create a vast kind of appendix of interpretations of that core brand that demonstrate more scale and composition and sort of copy, photography, imagery, all of those things are actually the kind of more, I think, more decisive elements that should and do change over time. When you look at the kind of core assets of the fundamental typography, the core palette, the suite of logos or other visualization elements, Those things really need to stay fairly consistent, but what you do with them really is where the difference comes in. And a lot of times that's very hard to articulate to say, you know, you can do this or you can do that with a logo. It's much better to show it. And Mm -hmm. so a lot of our work will have a kind of core guidelines document. And this goes for art museums that we've worked with and cultural institutions as well. These are the core assets. That's sort of the the DNA of the brand. But then providing a lot of examples that show that it's not that limiting and that there is a lot of territory in the elements there. In the case of American Express, we're doing this on an ongoing basis where we're kind of iterating from within the guidelines just to serve as a kind of ongoing visual story that proves that there is life in the system. Because I think when people encounter these toolkits and guidelines, their first thought is, why have you taken away all of my creative agency? What's left to do? You've told me I can't do this and I can only do that. And it's a really tough thing to articulate that actually is most clear when you give someone just examples of work and you put them side by side and kind of demonstrate the versatility that's that's there. And you almost have to model that because guidelines themselves can feel like 
they're really closing off a lot of options for people. That's how we handle that. That's what you did for us, Abbott. When we celebrated our 100th anniversary in 2013, Abbott put together a whole brand language that, that all of our divisions could use as they celebrated. And that included like trade show exhibitions and signage and graphics and you know, down to the gifts and presents that would be given away. So that actually became a great unifying tool that if we didn't do that, you know, we would have had chaos with our brand mm-hmm. all over as they each individually wanted to try and do the right thing, which is celebrate 100th anniversary. For us, it was it was crucial to have that sort of brand language. I don't even want to call it guidelines because guidelines might sound so restrictive, but it, it was. It was lots of visuals that gave the local people ideas of how they could extend the anniversary brand into their market. So that was cool. Right. You're trying to act more as a catalyst, but at the same time, you're saying there are rules, but the catalyst part is more to be um, kind of provoke inspiration. And you're talking to other designers. So it's not a general kind of, you know, go team go. It's more like, here's what somebody did. Here's what someone else did. And now you try. Yeah, I mean, the way I'm feeling it is though you're trying to sort of put parentheses around a personality and you're saying, absolutely, you're saying, here's what this person would wear on a given day for a kind of an occasion. And, and if it doesn't feel like this person would wear it, then it's not appropriate to the brand. Right. Not to go back too much to American Express, but we even put it on a spectrum because Amex sponsors a lot of events. When they are part of Coachella, they don't want to look like the the same company or they don't want to speak in the same voice that they would in an Amex office. So we created this kind of spectrum for them that was sort of at one end very close in on core brand, more or less buttoned up. Mm-hmm. And at the other end was event space like Coachella and understanding that there's almost a sliding scale where you're – really close to core brand, and then maybe what goes furthest out and is a little more playful, more experimental, a little less pious about the brand. And I think that's really important to understand that it's not a the, it's not one brush that you're painting with. You really have to allow for that kind of versatility. That's, I think, especially important for a brand like Amex that actually finds itself in a really wide range of situations. You don't want funny, playful, ironic when you're talking financial services and getting your sort of uh, statement from Amex. But when they're in party mode and sponsoring an event, it would feel weird if they were the uptight American Express that you know from your billing records. Right, right. You don't want your uncle to show up to your graduation party in a business suit. like. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and at the same time, if your uncle shows up and gets, you know, drunk <laughs> and embarrasses right. you, that's not good either. <laughs> right, or tries too hard. Right, you know, or tries some, too hard. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But that's, I think, important to understand about brands, too, is that they do have variation within their personality. They just can't lose track of who they are in their exactly. physical expression. And they need to have permission, too, to to change and to evolve. And that's always the, the biggest challenge. Um, interior designers have got to work with that all the time. Like, how do they evolve a space, you know, for the next for the next installation or for the, you know, for the next city that they're building another healthcare facility, for instance? So it's about evolution, and that's usually the challenge. For us, what we need to do is continually involve our options. We're like a toolkit. We're a paint box. You know, Abbott used the term a paint box. We don't design interiors. We offer many options, and we have to have full options that allow that interior designer to figure out what that brand space needs to be. So what does that look like physically? For us, it requires a nice balance of neutrals, warm and cool. And this actually changes globally. I found over the years that in the European settings, they have a tendency to like a cooler gray base or a cooler Hmm. neutral. In North America, it's been historically more warm. When I worked down in Australia and New Zealand areas, it goes a little bit more greener. So so the toolkit needs to be a little bit bigger when you're thinking about the global impact, even of neutrals, because there are either historic cultural
natural or the lighting effects, you know, how, how the light reverberates around in the exterior affects the interior or how people perceive color. Mm-hmm. So you, you always have to have a nice balance of warm and cool neutrals. You need to have visual texture that create interest where they need interest. You need to have something more bold that people can use as feature walls. You need to have bright chromas. You need to have trend colors or on-trend colors. So the toolbox has to be quite wide, and we have to constantly shift it. We have to constantly work with our customers to understand you know, where designers want to go next with the materials they want to work with. That is interesting. So much of it has to do with geography still, even though mm-hmm. sometimes we feel like the digital world is closing all the gaps. It's it's not really. We all still do exist in, in physical. We are a physical world, yes. Yeah, space. Speaking of that physical space, there are certain things that are really important to a brand that are exist in the negative space, like ambiance and intelligence or trustworthiness. How do you translate these certain characteristics of of a brand that might impact how somebody moves through a space or it experiences a space that aren't specifically made less abstract by a color palette and a typography language? It ties into the 3D space, meaning it's how do you carve out the interior architecture? You know, how do you feel the pressure points? Is it a low ceiling to make it feel more homey? Is it a tall ceiling to, to make it feel more grand? Is, you know, is, is it large flat walls or is it perforated with openings? You know, how do you, how do you take that space and use the interior architectural aspect of it, the 3D aspect of it, as you're making the decisions for the materials and the colors and the graphics, et cetera? I could give you an anecdote. I'm not sure if it's the right answer to your question, but I mentioned before that a lot of the times you're taking cues from a particular project and kind of riffing on it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, though, there's an opportunity to be more the counterpoint. And I worked on an incredible building, doing signage for this building in Monterey, Mexico, at the University of Monterey. And uh, it was designed by Tadao Ando, the Japanese architect. And it's this enormous, monolithic, really amazing building that is just every surface inside is poured cast concrete. And it's very geometric. It's very monumental. And it was really, to create signage for that building, it seemed like it was already so resolute and almost had, you know, I think there were, you know, standard door frames and windows that were incorporated, but everything, the floor, the walls, the ceilings, everything was concrete. And it was also very geometric, very sort of shard-like geometries. Mm-hmm. To create signage in that space, it felt like I can't join this this sort of discussion and, and be <laughs> equally uh, monumental because we're really dealing with wayfinding that's how people make their way through the building. So what we proposed was that we would, instead of being rough and gray and sort of um, in- extremely textural, we would do- make everything circular so it was sort of soft and a little more human, and everything would be super glossy and all the type would be super refined. And it was a really satisfying juxtaposition. I was, I was worried what the architects would would think of that idea, but they actually embraced it and were kind of happy to have what amounted to a kind of a dialogue between the signage and the building that was less traditional. When we do signage, it's usually all about continuing the kind of romance with the materials of the building instead of contrasting them. And in this case... These were sometimes three-foot diameter circles, or if it was a a sign for a fire extinguisher, it might be like a foot. And that was just a really nice opportunity to be almost a counterpoint to everything going on with the building. More often, the gesture is go along with and Mm -hmm. complement as opposed to deliberately creating contrast. 
I'm thinking about human behavior and I'm just thinking in, in natural human discourse, we frequently mirror each other. And that's your first instinct, which is to go along with. But yes, <laughs> occasionally you, you really can't just have more of the same. It's just too much or it's not going to work. And you and you do need a nice, refreshing counterpoint, a, right. a difference of opinion that somehow balances. Right. And I think there are those emotional cues in buildings that... The signage is a little bit of a, a a hand, you know, reaching out to guide you through the building. <laughs> yes, so you yes. almost it's a, like a little bit more of an intimate moment. It needs to be and, approachable uh, as opposed to admonishing. <laughs> yeah, we work with architects who tend to like the contribution of signage. Uh, I, I think there's ways of approaching signage and environmental graphics that are strictly utilitarian. But I've worked with Tom Main from Morphosis and Todd Williams and Billy Chen on this building for 10 cents designed by OMA. And there's an openness to what graphics can bring. And I feel like that's probably changed a lot over the last 20 years, a kind of desire to see, well, what can graphics do? What can media bring? You know, there's a greater appreciation of this layer that is inevitable in buildings and an eagerness to start to incorporate it sooner and sooner in the thinking about public space. I think that's wonderful because then the challenge isn't so much how do I make this afterthought feel like it was thought of and integrated. Right. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's more like, hey, we understand this is part of the what's going to need to happen in order to make this building be a really effective experience for people. So let's start, yeah. you know, working with I it. I think that's a, that's a really good point, because I think if we do come in sort of, quote unquote, too late, you're always looking for ways to make it feel like it's not too late, but it looks integrated. Yeah. <laughs> whereas, whereas a lot of times we're sort of like maybe two, two and a half years out from construction Sometimes that can be frustrating because, you know, graphic designers tend to like these, like, really rapid timelines. Um, architects have a much bigger appetite for that. You know, they need it. It takes mm -hmm. longer to do a building. But a lot of times we're involved in these things very early now so that that critical thing where you think about the user experience, the audience, ahead far enough that you can integrate and really change the course of how these, especially I'm thinking public spaces, lobbies, ticketing, all of these experiences are um, really critical. And, and you see it in buildings when it has not been worked out. You know, it can be an amazing signature piece of architecture. And you see people doubled back in triple form to go to the coat check or to get mm -hmm. their tickets and they're blocking the entrance. Yes. And it's sort of heartbreaking because you think, oh, did, I guess they didn't think about that. Yes, or they frequently bypass some of the most beautiful areas of space where the light comes in and the and the architecture is really carefully thought out. But because they have to get somewhere, they just go right past it or they it's it somehow becomes unnoticeable because it's not designed into the utility right. of the space. right. So, okay, so you guys are both on the front lines of translating brand into culture and physical space. So I'm assuming you both know all of the newest and latest tools and techniques and products. Are there any that you can tell us about that we in the A&D community should know about? We do quite a lot of fabrication and specification. I just did a big project with Audible. We use, I would say, the same tools that graphic designers use and that interior designers use. There's not really sort of anything very particular, I think, to the brand world. I think color, thinking for mica, but also thinking of Pantone systems, color continues to be one of the, I think, hardest areas of kind of translating and tools for translating brand colors or kind of a brand color, a palette vocabulary across from print to physical space. And we run quite a bit of testing, especially in the sort of purely graphic printed territory. We do a lot of testing 
to basically resolve the best possible build of CMYK, cyan, magenta, yellow, Mm -hmm. black builds to replicate the color because the Pantone references, RAL references, um, all of these color, Toyo, um, none of them are kind of beautifully um, sort of coordinated together. And so we really just always go back to um, what we see on the printed page as a reference. Okay. And then we, uh, you know, that's really our method. And that's actually a, a challenge for us because a lot of people are actually viewing and experiencing trends and, and visuals online mm-hmm. or on a digital screen or their computer screen. And then the expectations of what they're seeing with light emitting color versus a real material, which, you know, Re- basically flex. is reflecting the light back to you, right? So that has been a real challenge as the digital world has taken over. And we've gone from, you know, people that wanted sample books to now I can just go online and figure it out and get my sample overnight. And it may or may not be what they thought it was going to be. So that that has been challenged to make that that transition. And I'm hoping the technology actually would become better where an online color is representing what the physical sample is. Mm -hmm. But um, that would be, you know, the mecca of design. That would be fantastic. I think one indication of, you know, where where so much of this has gone is that we're guilty of it, too, is that you you see projects online, Mm -hmm. and a lot of times they're either completely rendered or they're halfway rendered or they're so Photoshopped and kind of juiced up that they achieve a kind of brand fidelity or brand kind of impact that, you know, doesn't really occur in in waking life. And I think that that's sort of, in a weird way, sort of informing a lot of the sort of standards and aspirations uh, around identity, around kind of just beauty. It's sort of what happens in the sort of world of mass media, idealized images of people, celebrities. It's really the same in the right, A&D community exactly. where, where there's a kind of a, a plague of perfection mm-hmm. um, and also this post, post-image uh, doctoring that goes on that is, you know, you've seen the buildings, you've seen the projects, and it's almost shocking when you see things that – have telltale signs that they weren't manipulated. So there's a funny kind of escalation of production standards that almost seems like, well, that's a big part of our industry. But at the same time, it feels really unrealistic. Like physical spaces don't look like that. Right. It almost feels like production standards and construction standards are starting to form a an opposition with each other in that – In order to look as perfect as it needs to in pictures, it needs to be more of a facade than an actual space. Right. And or it needs to be done in such a way that construction standards are compromised or not adhered to. I I see what you're saying. It's it's a it's also a homogenization of of standards that I think happens in in every area of aesthetics. And it's interesting. Do you think that's where we're headed in the future is more of this idealization? I don't know, unless it's a backlash, because I think that there's all kinds of other kind of currents of despecialization or less slick. You know, there's there's sort of mm-hmm. another goal um, that runs counter, which is realness. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, like for lack of a better way to put it, is versus like sending texts. Yeah, like a kind of almost rejection of the sort of perfectionism, rejection of slickness. I could see it swinging back rapidly in that direction. I mean, the sort of hipster, um, local, authentic. I mean, that's. That may be a cliche, but it seems like there are values within it that Mm -hmm. run counter to super slick international style design. There's a positive aspect to all of this visual imagery being out there. In one ways, it could lead to commoditization and, and expectations 
are set by the digital image, but in other ways, it is a great way to capture inspirations. For instance, if a designer is working on a space, if their client can send them a bunch of images that inspire them, that can then go into kind of the ideation phase um, much easier than sitting down and just talk, talking to a person. If you can kind of combine the, 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 the visual with the thoughts, that does help. I think a designer get to a better place that they can then create a good a good space back, but it does come with its faults because then the expectations, as as Abbott was saying, with you know this this is the production standard should look just like this picture that we brought in. Yeah, and I think you know we used to be able to visualize something for a client that had a kind of a latitude in it for yes. well, this is the intent, and this is it'll look something like this. The expectation now is that if it doesn't look like the rendering, it's not a success. And I think that there's – although that's safer, especially for, you know, if it's a big project and a lot is at stake, there's a lot of comfort that comes from that. But there's also inevitably a kind of a a lack of surprise, which, you know, from in a corporate context, that's usually preferred. (laughs) But there's a lack of that magic of transformation where you just say it's going to be – more tactile. It's going to be more interesting. It's going to be more colorful. Um, that shift that used to happen from design intent drawings to the finished experience, there was a little more magic that happened in that. And now it really is like if you didn't see it in the rendering and it, if it didn't live up to the rendering, it's a huge disappointment. Well, what is coming down the pike for both of you? Renee, what's going on with Formica? What's new? Well, what's new is we now have, we're part of a larger group. And so we have some new brands that we're going to be working with. Fenex, which is a wonderful new surface that is anti-fingerprint. Also, Trespa exterior cladding. So we, we have new partners that we're working with. So I, I now have some, some good Italian and Dutch and German cousins, which, are, which is fantastic. We also have a new commercial collection coming out. We update mm-hmm. our sampling tool that interior designers and architects have in their offices. You know, we have thousands and thousands of these out. So we are updating that in our two-year cycle. We have our Surface Set 2020 coming out this fall. So with that, we have looked at what's happening in in interiors and in new materials in inspiration you know looking at what's happening online digitally that inspires people and that has become sort of our our forecast that drove the materiality of our brand where we actually created production sheets of laminate ready to go where we can ship one sheet or 2000 sheets tomorrow again that's where the ubiquitous brand that we need to service the world right Immediately. (laughs) We also have our future vision, which is our trend document that our international design staff puts together every two years. And that's available online through Issue, I-S-S-U-U. And if you just search for Formica Future Vision, you can actually see our forecast colors that we worked on a year and a half ago that now are coming to fruition with our new Surface Set launch. Very nice. And Abbott, what should we keep an eye out coming from you and Pentagram? And where can we find it when it's available? Our website is actually a great platform. I have 23 partners at Pentagram (laughs) who are all (laughs) prolific and producing beautiful work. And so that's probably the best place to see what kind of work that we do I'm working on a big project that I can't talk about. <laughs> that Always. <laughs> there should be evidence of around January that has uh, been super interesting because it's very aligned to this idea of a refresh of a, of a great brand. I'm also working on some interesting projects in Washington, D.C. I'm working with the Folger Shakespeare Library, which is expanding into uh, building a new exhibition space. I'm working with Kieran Timberlake, who are amazing architects in Philadelphia. We are also, as a team, working on uh, a project at the Kennedy Center, which is similarly about getting people to understand that the Kennedy Center is actually a living memorial to President Kennedy. It's a tough sell just because the Understanding is that it's a performing arts center named after Kennedy. Mm. Um, Very few people know that it's really equivalent in its status as a memorial to the Jefferson Memorial and the Lincoln Memorial, the FDR Memorial. 
And so we're working on kind of reframing how to get people to understand that the space itself and all of its programming is the memorial. And that's been a really interesting process that's been going on for about a year and a half, uh, collaborating with Kieran Timberlake as well. These are, you know, iconic buildings that are super interesting to work in because they are so historic and so materially specific. So a lot of our work in both cases is about inserting these new elements in ways that are very cognizant of the fabric of the building, but also not trying to pretend like these things were already there. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the great aspects of working in kind of 3D spatial uh, environments that aren't aren't brands per se, but have a fully elaborated physical presence yes. and conceptual footprint. And so we're really enjoying those projects uh, along with other brand identity things that are that are in the works uh, with American Express still and with Audible, the story company. Well, we'll definitely keep an eye on that. And that URL is pentagram.com, correct? And, and we are formica.com. Very easy. Well, you two are so fascinating. Thank you for Thank sharing you. all of this with me. This has been really amazing. Thank you. Hey, thanks for listening, everyone. We want you to be a part of this. Visit Neocon.com and check out Neocon's blog and its social channels to stay up to date on what's happening in the industry and to tell us what you want to hear. Please subscribe to Neo Conversations on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Amy Devers. And be sure to check out my other podcast, Clever, for a window into the humanity behind design at cleverpodcast.com. Neo Conversations is a production of 2VDE Media. This episode was edited by Rich Straffolino. Thanks for listening. We hope you liked this rebroadcast episode and we'll check out the other episodes of Neo Conversations. We'll be back soon with another episode of Clever.